everyone. Um, as Andrew said, we're continuing, technically continuing our uh, sermon series on Paul. And how many of you guys were here for the movie last week? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've seen that movie before. And although it covers the last days of, of Paul's life here on earth, um, he really kind of started even from the beginning, you know, and what he did in the beginning and kind of went back in time. And so tonight we want to do that as well. We're going to start with where he came from and who he was and how he was raised. And this is important because oftentimes we look at the Apostle Paul and we can be surprised at where he came from. We see him as a full-fledged apostle of Jesus Christ, preaching to the Gentiles and having very long and rational arguments with people about the resurrection of Jesus. And sometimes we forget that he had a past. We forget the events that led him to where he is now, or where he was when we read the scriptures. And oftentimes we look at people and we just assume that, hey, they've always had it good. They've always been there. You look at countless examples through history. One of my favorite characters to look at through history is Abraham Lincoln. We know him as one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history during the American Civil War. And that's kind of the only time we really hear about him. But we'd be surprised to know that he had a really, really, really rough life. I mean, born in a log cabin in rural Kentucky, which if you ever wondered where Lincoln logs come from, there you go. Raised to an illiterate father and a mother who was frail and sick. His mother died when he was young. Growing up, he tried to start a business and failed. Then he tried to run for Congress, for state Congress, and was basically laughed out of there. Was laughed out of law school. He started another business, failed that one as well, and spent the next 17 years of his life paying off debt. He tried to run for state senate. He failed at that too. Eventually, he became engaged and thought he was going to start his life, only for his fiance to die before they even got married. By the time he was president of the United States, he had led a really, really rough life. And even when he started the presidency, he was thrown almost immediately into a civil war. And then after he was victorious, he was assassinated. But you see, we focus on those four or five years of his life in history class, but it's really important to know where he came from. Because when we realize where someone came from, we appreciate where they are now. And so when we look at Paul, there's a perfect place in scripture, and we're gonna study that tonight, where he talks about his life and maybe provide some surprising facts to those who are hearing it. So go ahead and open up your scriptures if you have it with you. And I encourage you guys to bring it with you every Friday to Acts chapter 26. The book of Acts chapter 26. And this is Paul before King Agrippa. And he's in chains. He's being accused of all kinds of things. Of blasphemy. He's being accused of stealing people's businesses or their business revenue. And so in verse 1, he's before the king. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made this defense. I consider myself fortunate that as before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against the accusation of all the Jews, especially because you're familiar with the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. And he knows it's going to be a good sermon when you say, please have patience with me, right? So he keeps going. Please have patience with me tonight, okay? Verse 4. My manner of life for my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Paul wasn't born in Jerusalem. He was born in a city called Tarsus. It's a modern day Turkey. And if you have your Bibles with you, you know those maps in the back that you would use to look at when you're a kid in church and bored, right? So those maps in the back, if you open it up, if you go from Jerusalem and then just take your finger up about 582 miles, right? Or about three inches, 
Take it up to southern modern-day Turkey, and there's a city there called Tarsus. That's where he was born. That's where he was raised. We can assume, just from what we read, that he was pretty well off growing up. His parents were tent makers. He was a Roman citizen, which means that his parents had owned land, because that was the only way to become a citizen, is if you own land. And so he was raised and educated. He said he was the strictest of all the sects of, of Judaism. He was a Pharisee. In another place, he says, I was, I was a, a, a very zealous Pharisee. He kept not just the law and the scriptures, he also kept the traditions of the Pharisees and of the elders and of the rabbis before him. He wanted to make sure so hard that he pleased God that he would do things that scripture wouldn't ask him to do, just in case. By the time he was 13 years old, which in Jewish culture is when you would become a man legally, by the time he was 13, he must have been well versed in Jewish history, in the scriptures. And at that age, his parents probably saw, we have a gifted son here. Let's go and send him to Jerusalem to train. And so there was somebody, Paul said that he, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. And I know I'm butchering his name, but G-A-M-I-L-E-L. -L, and he was his, his tutor. He was his mentor. Growing up, he studied under him. He was a rising star. We can look in Scripture and see that he was present at the conversations at the stoning of Stephen. And certainly, as a devout Jew, he was in Jerusalem during Passover week and heard about Jesus. Maybe he even saw him or heard from him directly. We don't know, but it's entirely possible. Certainly, he was interested in what was going on. He had a bright, young future ahead of him perhaps joining the Sanhedrin, which is like the Supreme Court of Israel. And so far, so good, right? Like, man, if this was my autobiography or where I was coming from, I'd be pretty happy. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop his story there at just saying, I was a Pharisee. You guys know my story and the culture. In verse 9, he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them and I punished them, often in all the synagogues, and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury, raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. The Paul that we know in scriptures that gave us the book of Romans and the letters to the churches and the pastoral letters hated the name of Jesus Christ. Literally to the point of putting men and women in chains and sending them off to death. Trying to force them to renounce the name of Jesus. Paul is not proud of those moments in his, li in, in his life but he's not afraid to share them with others. He knows that he had a dark side, that he had a point in his life before he knew Jesus where he was a completely different person. And he's sharing it before a king of all people. He's sharing that he was present at the stoning of Stephen. He also was in town when Jesus was, was, uh, had basically a mock trial and was persecuted and ultimately crucified and he doesn't shy away from the fact that he was probably present at those meetings where they condemned Peter and the apostles to jail in Acts chapter 5 and then when they miraculously escaped from there Paul had a sinful past a dark past and we all have a sinful past we are born into birth into sin and by our nature and by our choices. Romans 5 says that at one point we were all enemies of God. Literally enemies. Not acquaintances. Not people that God looked on so and so. We were enemies. God couldn't be around us. But his heart was always for us. And always pursued us. And his grace relentlessly came after us. 
But until there was that sacrifice by Jesus Christ, there was no way for us to be reconciled. We were at enmity with Jesus. We were utterly blinded by sin before we knew Jesus. Regardless of the past, though, and this is what Paul says throughout his letters, he acknowledges his past. He acknowledges where he's been. He acknowledges his story, but he always acknowledges hope. He always acknowledges that there is hope. That's why he loved the gospel so much. That's why the gospel means good news. That's why in Romans 1, 1, 6, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it has the power for everyone who believes. It is the power of God for everyone who believes. It is the hope of God. It is the surprising grace of God for everyone who believes. Many of us sometimes get stuck in the past. Although we might be Christians now and serve the Lord and worship him, a lot of times we are stuck in the past. And no, not just with fashion, right? Sometimes if I'm about to step out of the house, my wife will look at me and be like, those clothes are so like 10 years ago. And I just say, I don't care. I don't care anymore. All right? I got two kids. I, I don't care. Whatever. Not stuck in the past with other things. We're stuck in the past with things that maybe we've done to other people or that other people have done to us. Maybe sins that we've committed or sins that have been committed against us. And what that does is it starts to create just a vine that slowly entangles you and slowly drains the life out of you because we're allowing the past to have a hold in our life. We all have a story. It's not like one day we wake up and we can't remember anything that happened before we knew Jesus. We all have a past. But is it still holding on to you? Is there still forgiveness that needs to happen in your life? Is there still repentance for something that needs to happen in your life? I've often said that when you don't forgive somebody, it's like drinking poison every day. And you don't know why you're sick. But you put a drop or two of poison in your food every day and you're like, I wonder why I'm sick. It's because you're not forgiving. It's because unforgiveness is a bitter poison. And if we don't repent of it, if we don't confess it, if we don't make an effort to forgive, then we're slowly dying on the inside. And we're allowing the past to have a hold on us. Paul, of all people, knew that. And if you saw the movie from last week, you saw where he would have, he would have those scenes and those dreams or whatever you want to call them where he remembers how he persecuted the church. And he just broke down every single time because he knew he had a past. He knew he had a past. But then he looked forward to the glory to come. He looked forward and he looked at where God took him and where he is now. And even though he was suffering... He said, I count myself worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus because I know what I was doing before, but now I'm where God wants me to be. And nobody can or should force you to share your story from the past. Um, we get to see it because Paul wrote letters, right? And so he is, is sharing his, his soul and his past and where God has brought him. And no one's going to ask you to write these things down in the book and share them to the world, right? But you can. You can. And here's what I mean. There are times when our story serves a purpose. There are times where we can look in the past and regret what we've done, but maybe we're in a certain place or a certain time where God can use us and use our story to turn others to Jesus. And that happens all the time with me when I'm talking with people. Um, you know, I, I don't talk a lot about the past even from up here because uh, it has to be the right context. It has to be the right time, right? It has to be when the, when the spirit leads. And so when you're talking with people, when the opportunity comes up and you feel the spirit leading in that direction, you can share your story. Because that's exactly what Paul was trying to do here. Later on, uh, King Agrippa and also Festus they're talking to Paul and saying, Paul, are you trying to convert us? Are you trying to make us believe in Jesus too? And Paul says, I, I wish to God that all of you would be like me except for these chains. I wish that all of you would believe. Because that's the reason he was telling these stories. That's the reason he was sharing this hope. That's the reason he was bringing this forth for them to hear. It's never too late to start doing what is right. If the past has been holding you back, if there's maybe unforgiveness in your life, 
If there are things that still have a control or a hold on you, things that happened years ago, would you lay, let grace surprise you in this evening? Would you let the Spirit of God surprise you in this evening? Would you let, as we're going to see, Jesus come and surprise you in this evening with his presence in your life? Because we see that Paul was surprised and captured by a sudden grace. He goes on when he's talking to King Agrippa, and in verse 12, he says, In this connection, I journey to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone all around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul, up to this time, the word tells us in Acts 9, 8 and 9, that he was still breathing threats and violence and anger towards Christians. Think of that imagery. He was so, such a violent man at that point that every part of his body was exuding that energy. He was breathing those out. His words were just violence against people. That's how much he hated those who worshiped Jesus. In his mind, he was protecting the Jewish faith. In his mind, he was trying to be zealous for things of God. He thought he was powerful. He got permission from his boss. He said, you know what? I'm going to go to Damascus. I want to travel 100 miles and go and start taking up men and women from there and put them in prison because I love God that much. And look how much power I have. And they're going to be so scared when they see me. And on that road to Damascus, Jesus appeared before him. And he fell powerless to the floor. Fell powerless. So many times when we see in scripture great men and great rulers, kings, thinking that they're powerful. Yet when they come face to face, sometimes not even with Jesus or God, but with an angel they fall on their face, terrified. Paul, on the road to Damascus, is utterly powerless. His rebel will is captured, and God chose this time to intervene and surprise Paul with his grace. He chose this time because this is the greatest hour when it will have the greatest impact. Now, some of us might like surprises. Um, I actually enjoy surprises, like a surprise birthday party, or, you know, I find surprise ice cream in the freezer at home. I didn't buy it, but it's there. Hallelujah. I love surprises, right? Uh, my wife, not so much. She's like, please don't ever throw me a surprise party. Don't do anything like that. I will not enjoy the party, right? Um, I did have a surprise a few years ago that I did not enjoy, but it was definitely a learning lesson for me. A few years ago at Winterfest, when uh, I was scheduled to preach, to say a message, my wife at the time was about six months pregnant. And we were praying in our seats, and all of a sudden she gets up and leaves. So, you know, I don't think too much of it. And then a few minutes before I go up, I turn, and she's not there, and I see a bunch of blood on the seat. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And I was just supposed to go up and preach about how our lives are in God's hands. And my six-month pregnant wife is nowhere to be seen. She ran out. I tried to go out in the hallway and look for her and see what's going on. I couldn't find her. I sent someone you know, to the restroom. I, 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 I couldn't find her. My mind went to the worst places. My mind went to, Lord, I'm about to preach about how our lives are in your hands. And now I'm worried about a life, right? I'm worried about what's going on. After about five excruciatingly long minutes in the hallway of the church, right, I, I finally see my wife and she's fine. And so then the question comes, okay, like, what happened? And it just turns out that someone who had been sitting around me had a bloody nose as they were praying, right? And of course, I felt instant relief, but that was a surprise that I did not enjoy and that I was not expecting. But it was a lesson for me. It was a lesson that, you know, our lives really are in God's hands. 
that our lives truly are shaped by him. And man, I felt if there was ever a definition of powerlessness in the dictionary, just put a picture of my face in that moment right there, and that was me just completely at the mercy of God. And we've had those moments in our life where you're just so completely surprised and shocked at something going on that you have nothing else to do but say, Jesus, take the wheel. Maybe it's, it's, it's a family matter that just hit you like a brick wall or a car accident. And after it happens or while it's happening, you just have that feeling of powerlessness and asking, God, I need you to intervene right now. Lord, I can do nothing right now. I'm completely at your mercy. And these moments and experiences jolt us out of our comfort zone and make us realize that God is in control. And Paul was having this moment, completely powerless, completely at the mercy of Jesus. God wanted him to understand. that He couldn't go on in his own power anymore. When God brings us to those moments, and he takes us through those times where our, our power, our, 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 uh, our reasoning meet their limits. God is telling us, you need to depend on me. You need to look to me. You need to trust me. Because this road that you're going on is not the right road. I have something more for you. For more than three decades, Saul controlled his own life. And Jesus knew his name. Jesus knew his deeds. And we can't run from an all-knowing God. We can't run from a God who knows the hairs on our head. And Solomon says that even the light is like night to you and the night is like light. It doesn't matter. God is all-knowing. We can't run away from him. The great thing about this is we can't run away from God, but God is relentlessly pursuing us. His grace is relentlessly pursuing us. His love is relentlessly pursuing us. And when we come to that moment where he meets us, where he surprises us with his grace, the question is, what are we going to do? What are we going to do when we come face to face with Jesus? C.S. Lewis is famous for saying that when you read about Jesus, about the resurrected Jesus, you can think one of three things. You can think he's a liar, that he really wasn't who he said he was. You could think he's a lunatic, that he's crazy, that... He wasn't in his right mind. Or you could see him for who he really was, a Lord. But he had to make a decision. If Jesus truly is resurrected from the dead, that has to change your life. That has to change the the decisions and the way that you live your life. We had Mike Lacona come up back in August for one of our reverent nights. And he, he specializes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he spoke about you know, some missing commas in the Bible and things that people really like to point to and say, see, the Bible's wrong. It says there's a comma instead of a semicolon or whatever. He says, look, if we can just show that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was true, all that stuff doesn't matter. All this stuff truly doesn't matter. The Bible matters. The word is inerrant. But it all comes down to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians in, in chapter 15, if, if that's not true, then our preaching is in vain. If the resurrection of Jesus isn't true, then what are we doing? But we all have a decision to make. And some people say that his conversion started when he, when he said, uh, who are you, Lord? But really that word Lord is just, um, it's like what we would say, sir, today. Uh, and there were a lot of people who doubted his conversion. It was so sudden. I mean, how do you go from being, uh, from being violent and bringing people to prison to all of a sudden saying that you're saved? When did it happen? Well, regardless of when it happened, we know that it did happen when he changed his mind about who Jesus was. That's metanoia. That's literally a changed mind. When in his mind Jesus was dead, literally, right? It's like the guy died a few years ago, and now he's literally alive right in front of you. And that changed the course of his life. 
Jesus has to be real for us. Jesus has to be alive to us. If not, if we live like we did in the past, then Jesus isn't really alive for us. We don't truly believe in that hope. We don't truly believe in that grace in our lives because we're living as if Jesus is dead, as if we're still dead in our sins. But we were surprised by grace. We were surprised by the presence of Jesus in, your, in, in our lives. And because of that, because of that, we can look to the past and not live in it, but we can use it for God's glory. Amen. And there are many who doubted his conversion methods and, uh, you know, were saying that he wasn't really saved. Uh, but it was a deeply personal experience for Paul. It was deeply personal. If we go to Acts chapter 9, verse 7, which is where the original experience happened, it says that the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. This was personal for Paul. He saw Jesus. The other people didn't see him. They only heard Jesus. It was unique for Paul at that moment. See, those moments of salvation can happen in many different ways. We don't, even in our church, and not many churches, have a, this is exactly what salvation looks like. You hear this sermon, and then you come and kneel front in the altar, and then we pray for you, and then you're saved. Um, we don't do that because it can happen in many ways. Maybe it does come from a sermon that you hear. Maybe it is through a song and the Spirit touches your heart. Maybe it's through a personal prayer to the Lord after you read Scripture. Through a testimony from someone and you feel the Spirit working on your heart and you give your life to Jesus. It can happen in many different ways. But the universal truth behind all of this is that it brings you to a decision point of what you think about Jesus when he's right before you. All those different methods, a song, a sermon, a prayer, they all bring you to a point of saying, Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. All of those bring you to that moment. There's different methods, but the same Savior. And the question that Paul was challenging to the king and to everyone was, what do you think about Jesus? Who do you say he is? Because I know who he is. I didn't, but now I know. Regardless of my past, he surprised me with his grace. Now I want us to stand up and invite the team up here. Paul's conversion may have been sudden and certainly unexpected and surprising. But there's a key verse in here, and I'll just read it real quick, also from Acts 26, where Jesus says to Saul, after why you are persecuting me, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to kick against the goads, not goat, but goad. A goad was a tool that a farmer would use to keep the cattle in line. Usually a long stick with a metal piece at the end. And would use it if an ox was plowing the field to keep the ox in the right track. Tapping them on the side or keeping them maybe on the other side. And if the ox would try to fight against it or kick it, sometimes they get injured. Or it wouldn't be a good experience and they knew they had to stay on that path. So if we read closely, yes, Saul was, had a miraculous moment, a sudden, surprising moment with grace. But Jesus said, it's not easy for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean? Why? Why would he say that? I believe that the Lord was leading Paul to this place all along. How? We said at the beginning, Paul was probably in Jerusalem, maybe even heard the words of Jesus, certainly heard what he was talking about. He was present when they were putting Stephen on trial and his innocent face, it says, shone like an angel, began to talk to them about Jesus. He heard that. Maybe he was wondering how somebody could have such strong of a faith as they were going into prison, as he was throwing them into prison and they wouldn't renounce Jesus. Maybe he was wondering about that. And then he got to a point where it all made sense. 
where he was powerless, fallen down. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And everything clicked when he saw the beauty of Jesus before him. That Jesus was leading him on this road the whole time. The Lord leads us in those directions. And if you're saying, well, I've never had a miraculous moment like Saul, listen, I haven't either. I didn't have Jesus right before me and go blind for three days, okay? Not many people do. But the Lord, his kindness leads us to repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance. Where has God been leading you in these past few days and weeks and months? If you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, to accept him as your savior, the fact that you're here tonight hearing the gospel, hearing the message preached is a sign, is evidence to me that the Lord is goading you in this direction, that he's leading you in this direction. It's not by mistake that you're here this evening. It's not by accident. You have a past. I have a past. I could stay here all night and talk to you about it, but I won't. The past doesn't define you. Instead, let grace surprise you. Don't let the past define you. Let God's grace surprise you. I'm going to finish with a story. A man named John Newton. This man grew up in the 18th century without any particular religious convictions. But his life's path was formed by a variety of twists and coincidences that were often put into motion by others' reaction. He joined the Royal Navy, and after leaving the service, he became involved in the Atlantic slave trade. In 1748, a violent storm battered his vessel off the coast of Ireland, so severely that he called out to God for mercy. And this moment marked a spiritual conversion, but he continued slave trading until about 755, for years later. It wasn't until 1788, 34 years later, when he renounced his slave trading profession and wrote a pamphlet called Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade. And it described the horrific conditions on the ships and Newton apologized for making a public statement so many years after participating in the trade. He said, it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection on me that I was once on an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. The pamphlet was so popular, it was reprinted several times and sent to every member of parliament. And eventually, the English civil government outlawed slavery in 1807, and Newton lived to see it dying in December of that year. He is best remembered, though, for this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. That word wretch is very deep. It's very profound. Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. We're saying, Paul, you're modest. Let him use that title because I'm sure that's how he felt. I'm sure that's how Newton felt when he wrote the song, Amazing Grace, Surprising Grace. Save the sinner, save the wretch like me. I was lost. His grace found me and surprised me. He had a past. Paul had a past. We have a past. The difference is we also have a hope. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is hope. I want to be surprised by God's grace even in this evening. I want to be emboldened by his grace and by his love in this evening. And if you do as well, if you want to be a chosen instrument, not for evil things, but a chosen instrument, as Jesus said about Saul, a chosen instrument for my purposes. Don't let yourself be surprised by his grace this evening. Don't let the past define you. You can use it to share your story in the right time, in the right moment, but don't let it define you. It's not you. God made us completely new creations with new desires and a new heart and his law written on our heart. And he can surprise you with his grace even tonight. Even though this week you may have had some unpleasant surprises or frustrations, I want to be surprised by his grace tonight. I want to be surprised by his love tonight. And if you do as well, then join me in this time of worship and prayer.